Hello YouTube! Today we're going to be starting my introductory video into the Open Sicilian, and if you want to see more content like this and you like content like this, please hit that subscribe button and click on your notification icon. So the Open Sicilian is a very large opening. It happens after e4, c5, white plays knight f3, and he's threatening to play the move pawn to d4. Now when we talk about the Open Sicilian, we need to talk about all of the things that black can do against the Open Sicilian, and there are many. Black can play the moves d6, e6, uh, g6, a6, um, and knight c6. These are all the most common. And then, of course, there's outliers like uh, knight f6 trying to kind of turn this back into something different, like maybe an Alekhine's defense or something like that. So really, the open Sicilian is it's a huge, huge, huge opening. We, we can't really talk about it in terms of one opening. We have to talk about it in terms of each of these individual openings. We have to talk about the Shenigan, we have to talk about the Dragon, we have to talk about the Nidorf, we have to talk about the Paulson Khan, and we have to talk about the O'Kelly variation, and we have to talk about all of these things for what they are, you know, the Last Grip Pelican, etc., etc. We have to talk about all of these things independently. But there are some ideas that are universal across pretty much all open Sicilians, because the pawn structure in all open Sicilians is going to be the same once we play the open Sicilian. So in this video we're going to be focusing mainly on the Nidorf variation and we're going to be focusing on one specific main line within the Nidorf variation. We're going to be focusing on the fischer sozin variation. So after d6 and then d4 and then c takes d4 and knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, this is a typical thing that happens in the open Sicilian, we have a big branching off point even just within the d6 open Sicilian where we have three different main options here. We have e6, knight c6, a6, and actually the third main option is g6. So the three main options are g6, knight c6, and a6. And e6 is a fourth option, but it's usually interchangeable with knight c6 or a6. Nine times out of ten, it's going to transpose. So e6 is what we would call a Schwanigan pawn structure, g6 is a dragon, Knight c6 is a classical, and a6 is a Nidorf. And there's independent lines in some of these, and then sometimes, especially with these three, there is a lot of crossover. So there's going to be a lot of crossover and a lot of transpositions, depending on what you have in your repertoire and depending on what you're playing with the white pieces. So one idea in the Open Sicilian is after, say, the dragon, is white can play what they call a Yugoslav attack. This pawn goes to f3, castles, and then queen d2. So this is the Yugoslav setup. We play f3, bishop e3. This is to prevent that knight from going into g4 and harassing our bishop. And the main idea is that white wants to eventually trade off this dark squared bishop, pry open the rook file with h4, h5, and basically just play for mate against the black king. And this is a very typical strategy against the dragon, and it works pretty well. This was one of the first strategies that people came up with to combat the dragon. It was one of the reasons that people thought that maybe the dragon was unsound for a long time, because it seems like this is just a really basic strategy, and it seems very hard to meet. Um, the dragon is, of course, especially the modern dragon, this version of the dragon is actually perfectly sound, and um, it, there are ways to meet the Yugoslav attack without getting mated. One of the cool discoveries, like in the last 20 years, uh, well, I, not the last 20 years, maybe the last 30 years, because this started getting popular really back in the 90s, was when people started playing this Yugoslav setup against everything. And this is what we kind of call the English attack setup. And the reason that this works is because in every open Sicilian, there is a battle for this d5 square. And it's a really critical strategic battle. Basically, what's going on is in the open Sicilian, white has the advantage of rapid development and more space, and black has the advantage of having two pawns in the middle of the board. And because of that, there is this natural fight for d5. Because if both sides get their rook to an open file, like say if white gets his rook to a d file and black gets his rook to a c file, black is going to have access to the c5 square, white won't necessarily have corresponding access to the d5 square. Now in the dragon, the importance of the d5 square is really clear. We, we, we are threatening at some point to play knight d5 and remove black's last defender of the king's side and then deliver checkmate. But in every other version of the open Sicilian, the importance of the d5 square is also really clear. 
And that's why people play the English attack, but they take a slightly different approach. They get their English attack set up, and then their strategy is to play g4, g5, kick this knight off of the X, f6 square, and simply occupy that d5 square with a piece, or break that square down further, and eventually plan to occupy it with a piece. And this is the basic strategy of how to play against most open Sicilians with the white pieces, is to do something to try to control that all-critical d5 square. And so when we're looking at a more mainline opening, uh, like, say, the Nidorf with a6, and we're looking at something that I'm going to recommend, which is the fischer sozin variation with a move like bishop c4, the battle is for d5. And that's why bishop c4 is such a cool move, because it's just directly going after that d5 square in the most direct way you can possibly do it. And of course, the guy that really championed this was Bobby Fischer, and Bobby Fischer was always known for direct play. He always wanted to directly control the squares that he felt were important on that chessboard, and he wanted to do it as quickly as possible. So Black's next move is totally logical, and actually uh, it's almost obligatory. Nobody plays really anything else. Um, e6 is kind of the obligatory move. Uh, black is controlling that d5 square, and Black is also trying to prepare to eventually someday play d5 himself. And if he succeeds in playing d5 himself, usually Black will have an advantage. And that's why it's very critical for White to kind of lock down that d5 square, not just offensively to try to control it, but also defensively to make sure black doesn't play d5. So that's why white's next move, white plays bishop back to b3. He's getting himself out of the line of fire of the b5, b4 tactic, which would start removing defenders from d5 for white and maybe allow black to play an early d5. Um, there's also this weird possibility of a fork trick with knight e4 and d5 with the same concept, gaining control of the middle. It's not entirely possible right now, just because if, even with the bishop on c4, just because white has a huge development lead, but it's something that's on white's radar enough to where retreating this bishop makes a lot of sense. So we have bishop to b3, and then we have um, basically two main moves here. I would call the main lines, knight on b to d7 or b5 are the two main lines, but there's also options to transpose. We could transpose back into a classical slash Shenigan variation with a move like knight c6, or we could play bishop e7, which is trying to play kind of like a shen again where you're trying to tell white, okay, maybe you don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe you don't know if I'm going to play b5, you don't know if I'm going to play knight c6. And of course, we have to have preparation against all of these variations. And it's just too much to go over all of that in just one video. So we're just going to cover one of these variations right now. We're going to cover the super mainline Nidorf, which is b5. And then we're just going to cover a white side of the most aggressive attacking plan, which is bishop g5, just developing as rapidly as possible. Bishop e7 is uh, the move that is most often played here. And then we're going to have queen f3, just rapidly developing as quickly as possible. And here we have a tough inflection point for black, because it's hard for black to actually finish his development without falling into some sort of pitfall here. Basically, white has such rapid development of his pieces and such rapid deployment, he's threatening multiple sacrifices all at the same time. And he needs to sacrifice material or push material to break through so that he can break down black's control of the center of the board and have good places to land his pieces. So white is threatening something like bishop e6 and knight e6. He's also threatening something like knight, e, knight f5. He's also threatening a move like pawn to e5. And this makes Black's task of playing his next move actually kind of difficult, because if Black were to develop naturally with a move like bishop to b7, he would be abandoning his defense of the e6 square, and he would find himself in a completely lost position after bishop takes e6, fe6, knight e6, and then after this knight goes to g7 and f5, uh, the game is basically over. There's just too many threats against this poor Black king who's sitting in the middle of the board wide open to attack. And white already has three points for the piece, so he's not even down material. So we can't make this natural developing move, and we also have to be cautious about doing something really basic like castling, because there is this threat of breaking open the position very, very simply with a move like pawn to e5, and we need to be able to counter that with a move like bishop to b7. So that basically leaves two moves that are playable in this position, queen c7 and queen b6, so that we can at least meet e5 with the move bishop to b7. So we'll just go over one of these right now. We have the move queen to c7. And now there's two moves here. White can play either e5 or white can castle's queen side and continue attacking aggressively in both cases. Now, 
my original favorite in this position was Castle's Queenside, and then I went through a phase where my favorite was Pawn to e5, and then I'm now I'm back to, to Castle's Queenside as being my favorite move. Now, what's interesting is they're both kind of playing for two slightly different things. They're both playing for breakthroughs in the middle, of course, but they're playing for two slightly different kinds of breakthroughs. Um, e5 is a really interesting way to play for a breakthrough, and what really attracted me to it was this one game played by Vasily Ivanchuk um, against Sergei Karyakin that went e5, and then after bishop b7, um, we take on d6. Bishop takes d6. As you can see, we've broken down these central pawns, and then we're going to get our queen out of the line of fire, and we're putting all this pressure on the e6 square. Now, what I thought was really cool was Ivanchuk's idea here was actually after um, bishop to c5, castle's queen side, knight to c6, Ivan Shuk's idea was to sacrifice, wait for it, his entire queen to break down the pawn structure in front of the black king. And he won just this absolutely spectacular game against Sergei Karyakin after fe6, knight to e6. You can just see all of the threats on the board once that knight gets to the e6 square. We're bringing both of our rooks to the open file. The knight's going to be hitting c7, c7, uh, c5, g7. Everything's getting attacked. And Karyakin just was in tons of trouble, and it's not clear exactly what he should do. He played queen e5. Um, uh, we had knight g7 just because he can, brought the knight back to e6, and then we had king f7 by um, Sergei Karyakin, and then after rook hg1, Karyakin had to give up his queen, and it didn't help the situation. After he gave up his queen, he played this in-between move with check, and then he took his queen, and um, it, it looks like Karyakin's up a whole rook, but... Uh, as you can see, it's not so simple. Um, uh, Ivan Chuck has a bunch of pawns for it, but more importantly, this king is still in a shooting range out here. So after uh, knight takes b7, Karyakin's only up an exchange, but it's an exchange for three pawns, and then the king is in a firing range. And this was enough for uh, Ivan Chuck to convert this position into a win. You know, um, you know, down in exchange still, but three pawns. I mean, even materially, I guess Ivan Chuck isn't down. I mean, he's got three pawns and a piece for the rook, and this king is just, it's terrible. So that was what attracted me to it. But of course, um, ways to meet this move, uh, e5 got found, and, you know, people started playing them more regularly, so then I switched back to my old favorite, which was Castle's Queenside, and one of the things I like about Castle's Queenside is there's a little bit of poison within this move as well, which is if they play the move pawn to b4, then their position is basically lost up to the move knight to f5. And the whole point is, is this knight just can't be ignored, because on the last move they should have castled instead of played b4, in which case their g7 pawn would be defended. And since their g7 pawn is not defended right here, they can't really ignore this knight on f5. So their position is going to be completely losing no matter which knight they take. So like, if they take the knight on c3, they're going to regret ignoring the knight on f5, because of course we have knight g7 and bishop f6 is just completely winning for white. And if they take the knight on f5, then we're going to be flying into the position with the other knight. We're going to play bishop takes f6, and of course, if they recapture, this knight comes into d5, and then we're going to play ef5 with huge effect, with a great position for white. And if they continue capturing our knights, we're just going to take here, and we're going to take here, and this position should be completely winning for white, with black's king in the middle of the board, and the multiple threats that we have against his king and the rest of his pieces. So... This breaking down of, of Black's position with um, sacrificial ideas is really, really important in these types of positions and in these types of structures. So another uh, cute little sacrifice that you can try here is if they play the move queen b6, of course, there is a lot of crossover here. The move castle's queen side is still possible with this exact same crossover after castle's queen side, b4, and say knight f5. We have this very similar ideas. Um, we're still coming to the d5 square with tempo and very, very, very similar. Uh, another way you can actually play this is you can castle kingside. And I know at first this looks like it must be some sort of huge mistake because we're, of course, allowing <laughs> the queen to capture this knight seemingly for free. Um, but if the queen abandons the b7 square, uh, e5 is a very powerful move. And not only is e5 a very powerful move, um, this apparently leads to a winning attack for, for white. 
um, white actually has a uh, a winning position here uh, with the queen attacking the rook and of course the pressure that we have on this queen with the rook coming to d1 etc and just the fact that we're going to get our material back um, basically is what it comes down to uh, the queen really shouldn't capture that knight so castles king side or castles queen side are both possibilities so we have this main line we have queen c7 um, we have castles queen side and then I guess we could call the main line is not going to be pawn to b4. Um, the main line is going to be something like uh, castles kingside in this position. So we could say that the, the main line is something like castles kingside. And at this point, I would recommend another wild sacrifice here for white. I would recommend just playing the move pawn to e5. And then after the move bishop b7, what we intend to do is actually give up our queen. So after ef6, bishop f3, fe7, rook e8, gf3. So I know I've just shown two variations where we've played queen sacrifices. But this is the open Sicilian, and this is just what we do. Now what's interesting about this particular variation is this appears to be advantage white, and possibly major advantage white. So if this is the main line, I guess the main line kind of needs to change. Um, I guess not as many people are playing... Um, this queen sacrifices they should so gf3 and then d5 uh there was this game with um uh looks like uh J josh Ferdell played in foxwoods in 2007 that went knight e6 fe6 knight d5 and this was a completely winning position for white queen c5 bishop back to e3 we had queen c6 knight b4 and of course just the problem is this pawn on e7 is super super dangerous and it can be held and pushed and it's difficult to defend against it and after a few more moves, uh, Black had to sack his queen back, and then this endgame uh, is completely uh, losing for, for Black. There's, he's just down too many points. So that just ended in a win for, for White in Foxwoods in 2007. So Castles is actually kind of questionable, and I probably misspoke when I said it was the main line, because I think the main line is actually just kind of coming back to something like Knight on B to D7. I guess could be considered the main line. And then the main stem game we have here to go from is probably Miss Nespanu uh, versus uh, Karyakin, played back in 2006. That game continued with e5, bishop b7, queen g3, uh, knight takes c5. So of course we sacrificed a pawn with white, and now we're going to sacrifice more, why not? And we're just going to go after this super, super aggressive attacking position with the white pieces after this sacrifice on e6, which is kind of a topical sacrifice as we've seen before. We have king back to f7, finding it more important to defend the e-pawn and the g-pawn than to defend the knight. And we get our piece back, and then we have knight takes e6, sacrificing more material. And then after king takes e6, we have queen h3, king f7, and then this est ends in sort of a perpetual where we get endlessly uh, checked after a few more aggressive moves from white. After rook d7, uh, queen c6, rook hd1, rook ad8, we have queen h5, and now the queen can just shuffle back and forth uh, between h5 and h3, and this position is apparently just supposed to be a draw at this point. Um, white doesn't have any way to keep playing for a win at this point, according to the computer. So this could be, this knight on b to d7 could be considered the main line, and I guess for now this is kind of the path that we should be going down with white, we should be playing e5, you know, kind of followed by this sacrifice with bishop e6. So you can see in all of the lines, and even in all of the main lines, white is sacrificing material to break through, and we could just say that this is just how the open Sicilian is played. And this is just one of the reasons that even on the very top levels that they don't like to play the black pieces in the open Sicilian. Because the open Sicilian is one of those openings where you can go into a sacrificial variation like this and you can feel very confident that your position is completely safe because maybe the computer shows a perpetual check. Or if you leave your computer sit long enough, you might be able to find a win with white. But these positions from a human perspective, unless you're completely familiar with them with the black pieces, it's very easy to get checkmated in these positions with black, and it's very easy to lose games very quickly. So this is kind of your introductory video to the um, Open Sicilian. And of course, this video's primary focus was on the fischer sozin variation uh, with the white pieces. And of course, uh, we're talking about the super main lines of the fischer sozin variation with the move uh, with the early uh, pawn to b5. And of course, as we move on, we're going to have to cover more and more uh, variations. And I think probably just the first three or four videos are just going to be on the Fischer-Sosen variation against the Nidorf, and we're going to be going over the other main lines. 
But anyways, I hope that you found this video, help, video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess, and um, I hope that you can uh, at some point play the Open Sicilian with the white pieces successfully on your own. Um, thank you very much for watching.